like to talk to you a little bit and share with you um, some of the work that's going on in Springfield, Massachusetts. That is where I live. I do work for the Northeast Organic Farming Association. My work is statewide, but it's focused mainly in Springfield, which is a great joy for me because I'm able to impact the community in which I live, right in the neighborhood. All the gardens I work with are ironically within walking distance from my home. So it just shows how connected we are. Uh, the, pro the project that Paula mentioned at Home City Housing, we've been doing that project for the last couple of years. And we, I'll give you a snapshot of it in the short talk today. And then later in the workshop portion, I'll go more into detail about what we cover, how we got started, and maybe uh, some takeaways. I, I like interaction. So there's some discussion questions for people to consider to go back to their communities in terms of if this is something they'd like to institute. So I know a lot of people are familiar with uh, NOFA Mass, but I wanted to start off uh, with our partner, Home City Housing. Home City Housing is a low income uh, housing development that manages buildings throughout uh, Western Mass and Springfield, but predominantly in the city of Springfield. Uh, and that would be their Liberty uh, Heights apartment complex, their Twigs, one in two scattered sites, what they call scattered sites, these are individual homes for rent, and then Tapley Court Apartments where the community garden is housed. In 2017, the community garden was started by a group of families at that property. And the youth leaders were incorporated uh, during that year to assist in the work. So a lot of the families have older members who know how to garden or wanted to learn how to garden, but they needed a little help. And the youth leaders through their youth leader training program uh, took on a part of that as their training. And then we moved that into a larger program in 2018. Um, this past, uh, past year, we actually provided over 2,500 pounds of food, organic food to the residents of all the sites, as well as the, uh, the youth leaders and some of the surrounding neighborhood families as well. And as we as this is a conference about the environment bio for climate um i like the title blessed unrest because we wanted to do some unrest as it relates to our thoughts about how gardening in the in the community or in an urban setting at a housing development and nutrition really can come together to establish food justice so uh, you're looking at a picture here of some of our youth leaders. Um, that's Omar, that's actually Bernard's brother, uh, Ariana and uh, Ayana, three of our older youth leaders. Um, that is our garden and at Tapley Court Apartments. And we grow a wide variety of crops, much of which is what people want to eat. The youth uh, play an important part in planting that garden. And it's based on what they eat at home, what they would like to eat, and we dial it down to the bare bones. What does your grandmother cook? What's the favorite thing that, that you like to eat from your grandmother? What's the favorite thing that your auntie makes? Um, you like top ramen? Well, how about if we grow the ingredients and we can make our own healthier top ramen? And as the youth have begun to develop in this program, many of them are taking personal ownership. The quote that you see here came from uh, Ariana on the right, where she mentions, I feel like a hero for being able to feed people and to bring people food to right to their doors. Uh, that is the ownership that a lot of our youth are starting to take. And now they're beginning to understand that it's not, it's the food that's important. It's the self-determination over that food, as well as how it affects our community at large, whether it's feeding people, cleaning up the community, and also around climate change, how we all play a role in that. And it's not just for one group of people to do, but we all have a role in that. We have worked pretty diligently over the last couple of years to connect uh, soil health and human health so that the youth can see that everything is connected. Everything that they're doing is connected. So carbon farming and no-till farming is very important. We talk a lot about how carbon is held in the soil. We talk, to, we talk about how cover crops can assist uh, with soil um, carbon retention, with water retention. 
all of which does help in, the, in climate change. Um, the no-till techniques, we really have been pushing a lot, uh, a, a little harder. And I don't want to say a little harder, but get the understanding. I always use the uh, analogy that I got from Dan Kittredge, that if you leave the soil uncovered, that's like your mother being naked. You don't want that. You want it covered because it keeps everything in the soil. It keeps all the nutrients in the soil. It keeps the moisture in the soil. And by, and by kind of putting the bare bones like that, we get a good chuckle from it. But now they take ownership of it. So when their friends come to the garden, I can hear them say, yo, man, don't step in my plots. You're going to make it compact. And then they start to begin to understand and explain to their friends the importance of gardening in this uh, manner. I also like to point out that we are a purely organic garden, so there's no pesticides, no herbicides. Uh, we do use no tilling techniques in our plots. Uh, and even the a few families that farm with us, um, actually, pr they practice the same thing. And what's nice about having some intergenerational gardening, a lot of these things is not new to us. Uh, the organic techniques of growing food are things that we have carried as communities of color. Uh, in Springfield, it's predominantly pe black and brown people that live there out of 150,000 uh, residents. And in home city housing, it's 70% black and brown. And so many folks are bringing their growing tech, their growing traditions from the South, from Puerto Rico, from the Dominican Republic. And most of these techniques resemble what, we, what I've gotten from NOFA, what I've heard um, Jan refer to. Very simple things that don't have a big scientific name, but they still are dealing with climate change, with uh, keeping carbon in the soil, and with organic practices. We also make a uh, tie to personal or our human health. So soil health and human health are tied intric intricately. Uh, we also demonstrate this with another partner, uh, the Friends of the Homeless at their homeless shelter at 755 Worthington Street, where we work with the Diabetes Initiative. And the reason why we really want to tie soil health to human health in our communities, um, not only are we suffering from not having the proper food to eat. So there's food there. It's not necessarily a food desert, but it's what's left. So it's more like a food swamp. Fast food restaurants in all four corners. You may have some bodegas, some of which are very good. They do carry fresh produce, but there are others that don't. Um, and at your nearest full service supermarket, you gotta go 30, 40 minutes away, sometimes an hour via bus if you don't drive. And so we really wanna highlight that by growing your own food and, take, and taking care and being that good steward of the soil, those nutrients in the soil is also in our bodies and we make that connection to address things like diabetes, hypertension, um, blood high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And it's a project that Friends of the Homeless that we're seeing a good yield with. We have transferred that kind of teaching over to the youth at Home City Housing and this year we'll see more of that and have more um, correlation between human health, soil health, and why it's important to garden the way that we do. And I think I hit too many, oops, okay. So I'm gonna focus um, kind of on some of the topics give you a glance over in terms of some of the topics we've been, been able to do in the last couple of years. In the workshop, we'll take a deeper dive into what we cover. Um, with the youth so far, they have managed and they manage this garden, but they're able to actualize certain uh, aspects of organic growing, such as developing their own compost, um, and working with another urban farmer in the area, Andrew Lorian, and we've set up our own compost bin, and they see the importance of how you can make your own healthy soil. We talked a little bit about soil testing, why you want to test the soil. Much of the city, and whether you're in Boston or Worcester or Springfield, uh, there's contamination, particularly elevated lead levels, uh, elevated contaminants, and so now we're getting to more of that discussion of how we can address that. 
and that it shouldn't stop us from being able to grow. We just have to use different techniques. Now, one of the great blessings here at this site at Tapley Court Apartments, when we did the soil test, it came back very low lead levels. And so we were very excited. We could go right into the ground versus having to do raised beds like you see so much in other areas of Springfield and in Boston and Worcester. So we were very excited about that. Uh, we also wanted to show the greater view of agriculture. So from a full service farm in the Berkshires to gardening the community, which we are beginning a learning and teaching partnership in Springfield, to the Urban Farming Institute in Boston. We took the youth last year to all three of those so that they could see the connection, that this is all connected. And so it connects them to the greater body of organic growing, organic farming, um, soil restoration, that is not just us in that area, but we belong to a greater system and family. Also, uh, we talked a little bit um, about food justice because it's not just the growing of food, um, but there's a greater piece of food justice that you have a right as a human being to have access to healthy food. And sometimes you have to create that for yourself. And so we have gone into an extensive study of different food justice movements um, to Cesar Chavez on the farm workers uh, movement, the Delano farmers movement, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, so they could see the whole breadth and body of the role that farmers play, not just in soil restoration and being good stewards of the earth, but also being good stewards as a human being, making sure that there's equal rights, equal justice, equal food access for all. And they have taken, at first it was a little difficult, but they've taken that wholeheartedly, which has led to their greater desire uh, to work the, the garden and to increase its yield. Now, as we move into uh, COVID-19, uh, which has turned all of our organizations upside down, I'm sure that uh, by having this conference online, you all have experienced that. Uh, that's given us the opportunity as we meet with the, the youth virtually to plan our activities for 2020 to talk about, okay, how does our work with this garden help to ease issues like COVID-19? How can, what difference do we make with this garden as it relates to soil fertility, soil health, as well as being able to feed our families? And so the, the, the young man that will hopefully join me later on this afternoon Bernard, his whole view is we got to get out there because that garden is responsible for not just feeding my family, but feeding all the families at Tapley Court Apartments, feeding the families in the community. Um, we, we have people to feed. And so now this garden is not just a teaching site, but it becomes a uh, food source um, and a sense of empowerment for the community at large. And so that has been a, a great testament to their desire to learn more and to implement these practices. We, the last discussion we had was how does what we do with um, organic growing really help the environment? What, what does it cause? And so coming behind Jan, as she was discussing water issues, we talked a great deal about water retention, the fact that some of the runoff is not just going into the parking lot, there's a parking lot that's next to the, the, the garden, but that a lot of that water is held because we've done things like cover with um, cover crops and we keep uh, leaves in the plots as things are growing. We have no bare soil. Um, we do not um, till. So we allow the earth to replenish itself over time. And so having these small conversations with them and they get to see the practice and engage in the practice, now they see how it is actually uh, actualizing and becoming real. So I'm gonna leave it there because I don't wanna go too much into what I'm gonna talk about at 1.30 uh, today in the workshop. But if there are other uh, questions that people would like to have, if there are more, if there's more information about all of our food access programs, um, there is my contact information, I'll share it again at 1.30 uh, when we reconvene for the workshop. Did you have a chance to look at the questions in chat, Anna? I'm going to do that right now.
so I can get my computer to cooperate. Are you trying? Are you trying to unshare it? No, unshare I, the oh, screen. I just wanted to get to the chat, and uh, I think I got to okay. it. Were there any hands that were raised at all? Uh, not so far. Okay. I have a uh, question. How does it feel to do this gardening work? Oh, for uh, are you asking in terms of a personal question for me? <laughs> yeah, for you and all the people working with you, how does it feel? Well, on a on a personal note, um, and again, it's a I have a whole funny story as to how I got started, but it's an empowering thing for me because one of the things as the, the youth always tell me that I get excited when I talk about um, gardening is the, the level, the whole idea that we're not dependent on someone, that we have control of this, that we're not relegated to what's been given us. I'm not originally from Massachusetts. I'm actually from, I moved here from Baltimore, Maryland, and, and before that, San Diego, California. So being in a larger setting, there were more, I had more access to things. I moved here and to Springfield and people tell me, oh, I asked, well, where's the supermarket? It's way out the way, about 30, 40 minutes away. Okay, fine, my husband and I, we can go there, but my, t but my neighbors can't. And so they're stuck, if you will, with the stores that are right there. And so as I began to garden myself and get more involved with programming, that's why I got involved with programming, is that everyone has that right. We shouldn't be stuck with what's left in our community. We have the right to create our own situation and our own reality as it relates to ha having healthy food. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pull a few questions from the chat, if that's okay, Adam. Um, someone asked, are you able to offer the youth volunteers a stipend? Yes, they do receive stipends. Uh, they receive monies directly into home city housing from the New England Farm Workers um, Union and um, Mass Housing. Uh, home city housing gets two grants uh, to go ahead and give them stipends throughout the year. And then the program that NOFA offers uh, is part of their overall youth training program. Uh, another question came in, who owns the land you're farming in the city? How easy has it been to get permission? So this site at Tapico Apartments is part of Home City Housing. That's one of their uh, real, one of their apartment portfolios. They wanted, the executive director wanted to see a garden. The management and staff wanted to see a garden in conjunction with the families there. So that was pretty easy. Now in the city of Springfield, there is a community garden ordinance to get a lot in, uh, in get a city lot, there's, there's a way to do it. Um, some of your larger expenses though for that is getting a water line brought in. And the Water Commission uh, this year has been a little bit, has been a, a great partner as they change some of their policies to make it less expensive for people to have a water line put in. And so that they could get a very small grant uh, that will take care of that. Um, the, another question concerning, are you able to bring the food grown into the school cafeterias? Uh, not in this setting, that's taken care of through the school gardens, uh, Sodexo and the new uh, Culinary Nutrition Center in Springfield uh, through city schools. Um, that is not something we deal with. The food that we grow is distributed uh, to the families within home city housing. So that would be the 30 families at Liberty Apartments, uh, the 40 families at uh, Tapley Court Apartments where that garden is housed, and then the Twigs one and two uh, scattered sites apartments. Uh, someone handle, ask a question, how do you handle no-till and weeds? That's a good question um, because I, we do utilize the practice of biointensive growing uh, as a way of no-till gardening. But then as we set up the plots, we have gone, I've shown them how to use cardboard to cut off some of those weeds before you even get started, uh, to sift 
the soil as we take that top layer off to take out the weeds. And then uh, keep by like, keeping it covered with a mixture of straw and leaves, it cuts off the head, if you will, kind of helps dry out those weeds. So we practice that and they're getting very, um, um, they really enjoy that and see the difference in the soil. Um, another question on, could you please elaborate on what you said about raised beds or was, or was it that you don't use them? If so, why? We do use raised beds. Um, I'm going to define it in this way. We don't have all the beds covered with a wooden structure, but they are raised as we double dig, put the cardboard down and put that soil back, mix it with compost, and then we grow right in it. Um, another question about the school systems. Are you working with school systems to get youth to do gardening? And again, that is uh, through the school gardens. They have a series of school garden teachers through Food Corps. So that's not something I work with. Um, occasionally, I have done some things with the Food Corps members as it relates to soil fertility, because I am one of the soil, um, soil technicians for NOFA Mass. Uh, so sometimes we talk about soil testing, how to do that, and how to read the soil tests and do mineralization. But that is something that's handled through uh, Food Corps directly with the school system. And Any? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. I think John Feldman had a question about whether any sure. of the youth wanted to become farmers. And because we had a remarkable experience when we met them, could you, could you address that one? Uh, there are a few now that are talking about that. Now, at one point when they first started, um, they were not feeling it. I have to be real. That's how it is with teenagers. Um, their whole view is, I'm out here because I'm going to get paid. <laughs> but over time, because they see the importance of farming, there are a few that actually are looking at this as a career choice, as possibly going into agriculture. And as we're having more in-depth conversations with that group, I may be reaching out at looking at different resources and putting the folks in contact with the Stockbridge School of Agriculture. They were very moved by hearing from Glenroy Buchanan, who is a graduate of UMass's Stockbridge School of Agriculture, as a black man in that field in uh, New England, it, to hear his story and to hear how he's developed a business from it. That has caused them to think about, you know what, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is something I should study. And even the conversations they've had with me personally, how I've gotten into it, um, it's helped some of our youth want to study it a little bit more. So I'll, I'm looking forward to saying in a few years, we might have some future farmers on the way. Nancy? Uh, I was wondering do, if- Do you, you want to say so I'm sorry, Mary Beth, I was just- oh. I was just going to ask if, if NOFA or does training, because again, I'm thinking of this Appalachian project and I was thinking it would be wonderful to have trainers come in and start a youth program in, on a mountaintop removal site if it can be re rehabilitated kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just, this is intensive, wonderful training and organizing and I, you know, train the trainers kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That is something we are looking into. Um, and there have been times where that has taken place. Carol Roselle, our education director, has done that. I've done a little bit of that. And so we're looking to expand more of it as uh, my knowledge expands. And again, my background, and don't laugh, everybody, is out of procurement. I was a procurement officer for a good well, the Housing Authority of Baltimore City, and then with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So I don't have a background in agriculture. Everything I have learned has come from my own personal study, uh, working with NOFA, um, my mother, who is an avid gardener. So as I get more knowledge, I've been in that process of training others so we can do a train the trainer. But stay tuned. That is something that's coming. So thank you well, for the question. I that's so valuable. And I'll take your hands-on knowledge anytime. You know? <laughs> I think that's often more valuable than just head knowledge. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank so, you for that so question. Nancy Lee Wood, I see you leaning into your computer. And I know you have things to say about uh, teaching agriculture um, in, in a new way. Do you want to? 
Yeah, well, we've, we've been uh, working at Bristol Community College in Fall River uh, with an agriculture program. We developed um, a sustainable agriculture Oops. Um, that first was a certificate and then moved into being a major. And, um, and that's been going on now for, I'd say about nine or 10 years. And it's become a major part of our, um, of our program. Mm -hmm. But I think that this is a really wonderful way of connecting uh, young people within their, their living circumstances, their immediate living circumstances and getting them to be doing sustainable agriculture you know, in their neighborhoods, in their housing projects and so forth. And we haven't, we haven't focused on that so much. We've been focusing on, um, you know, just training students the basics of doing some sustainable organic agriculture. And then some of them have been trying to figure out how do they access land, which is a big problem mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and some people are able to rent the land. Other people are doing uh, backyard farming you know, where they go to different people's houses and they're doing backyard farming for them and so forth. But this is a wonderful program and I'd really like to, I'd like to get you connected with some of my students. I'm teaching a course called Food, Famine and Farming in the Global Village. Okay. And I teach it in the fall semester. And I'd love to have you uh, either come in person if that's possible, or we could mm -hmm. do it through a Zoom or whatever. But I mean, you're doing exactly the kind of things that I want these kids to be doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. Thank well, you so much. We definitely, we definitely can talk offline on that, but that, that would be wonderful. Even if they wanted to come out and take a field trip, maybe have a volunteer day when we're able to come out. Right. Because um, this is the, the, the difficult part. A, a lot of the youth are right. telling me, I want to get out in the garden. I want to get out in the garden. And I was right. like, okay, we try to work it out. But that would be nice yeah. I, to have that. Right. I wanted to just throw out a concept that I've been really thinking about just to this group because it's so important. But um, on this mountaintop removal site, I wanted to, to promote this idea of regenerative agriculture homesteading grants that we start thinking about for some uh, devastated lands, maybe there could be state or federal programs where if you work on that land and you're trained in sustainable and regenerative agriculture practices in a stipend that after seven years of working and meeting criteria, you could own that land. So it's just a thought to s throw out there because you guys are the people who do these things. Mm -hmm. But I just think that if we could talk about that kind of thought, that would be an incentive and help mm -hmm. people get back on the land. So just mm -hmm. throw that out. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, those are the things, funding is always an issue and how to marry that um, with what we're doing. Uh, that definitely is something I would like to explore. And I, I just wanted to backtrack real quick. Um, concerning this uh, comment and possibly a question from Barbara about how we work with leaves. And um, one of the things we emphasize in terms of, and we're going to talk more about this in this session, is the concept of bringing in beneficial insects. Uh, so, you know, having that cross reference between insects are good, we need them, we need the bees. Uh, and this is how we can do this ourselves by putting in pollinators, making sure we have flowering plants within the garden and how when you see a worm, so we had a whole discussion on earthworms, how we call them uh, the soldiers of the soil. And at first everybody was scared of the earthworm. I said, no, we, we, we need the earthworm. Don't be afraid of them. <laughs> uh, but then now they, they are understanding that science behind if you see earthworms, that means you have health there. So um, Barbara, I'm glad you, you put that in because going back, yes, we have the, the food justice and the activism, but then it's also tied directly to the science and the science of our bodies. Mm -hmm. Were there any more um, questions or hands raised? I think I got to the end of the chat, the questions in the chat. I just had a quick question for Nancy. Where Could you say what college you're in again? I missed it. I'm at Bristol Community College in Fall River, Massachusetts. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, we can break um, a bit early for lunch. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, thank you, Mary Beth. <laughs>
for the applause. Lunch, the lunch applause. And um, we'll come back at around 12.15 and Ralph Baker will tell us about a wonderful activist that we used to have in Massachusetts. And, um, and then we'll proceed to our afternoon speaker in the workshops. So see you at around. Okay. Applause for Anna. Yay. Yeah, that, that was what the applause was for. <laughs> <Not much. laughs> Thank you all uh, so much. I Thank figured. you. Thank you.